Um, there were, for 3A, there were three other resonance structures. Yeah. Um, and the trick with these is just to remember that you're moving electrons towards an empty space mm -hmm. for all of these. Um, I think most, I, the, um, the bottom one that was, that was trickier, people were not, sh you had to remember that there were two lone pairs on that alcohol. Because mm. people's first yeah. instinct sometimes is to move that double bond towards the alcohol, towards the OH group. But that OH, that oxygen already has a whole valence. Right, yeah. So the only one oh, that's you right. can move electrons towards the ketone, towards, mm -hmm. sorry, towards the aldehyde oxygen. But and that's yeah, what, not, the, not alcohol. the alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, alcohol alone pairs will participate in resonance by moving towards the carbon, not okay. towards the oxygen. Uh, and then similar similar thing on number 10. Yeah, everybody did did really well on number nine and number eight. Um, and the uh, the cyclohexane structures and the Newman projections, Newman projections, we could use some work. Remember, it can be helpful to draw out that whole structure first. Right. Yeah. So that you can picture it, because I think several several people put carbons in the wrong spot or attached to the wrong carbon, carbon or forgot that that Newman structure itself is showing two carbons. So if our structure is so here is our R two bromo three methyl butane. If we're looking down that bond, we're going to see bromine up into the, the way it's currently drawn. You're going to see bromine up into the left on the on this front carbon. This is the front carbon we're looking at. And then we've got a methyl going straight down, which is not a branch. It's part of the butane. But we can draw it as methyl and then a hydrogen this way. And then on this carbon, This carbon, we're going to have a methyl going straight up, a methyl down, and we I didn't show the 3D structure here because it doesn't matter as far as the it's not a stereo center. So, but if you have methyl going straight up, you'll have a methyl going here or here, and then the other spot is a hydrogen. So I think. Several people put like a C two H H five group because you were forgetting that the last carbon is eclipsed is behind this front carbon. Yeah, I forgot about that. So um, you weren't the only one. Yeah, which is why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> uh, and then this one, the way that I think it comes, is the highest energy. Um, so everything is like because everything we gouge to each other. Yeah, you have a total of of a of two bromine. Methyl gauge interactions and a methyl methyl gauge interaction. And if you rotate it so that the hydrogens are anti, then you wind up with a bromine methyl gauge and a methyl methyl gauge. So you just get everything as far apart as possible. Um, which I think, and every, everybody I think is, is okay with understanding that it was just getting from the name to this to this. Is where yeah, I think it's just getting the structure yeah. to the actual Newman projection. Exactly. Um, and then the, the other thing on number 10 that I was going to talk about is just remember that you're drawing the electrons moving. You never draw an arrow from a nucleus, from an atom, right. towards something else. Um, and uh, which, so if you want to look at the key for that one, you can check it. I think I, I left detailed okay. arrows on everybody's yeah. that, that needed the help with that one. Um, and you didn't need to say what, what type of step each one was, but it, it, sometimes it's helpful to remind yourself to classify it. Okay, by looking at the before and after, I can tell this is proton transfer. I've got to draw proton transfer arrows. Um, any, any other questions about the, the test itself? So that's up here, uh, seven, 
A part. Ah, uh, yeah. I got uh, that one. I was trying to think of them in my head, and I was like, axial versus equatorial. If they flip, they're not mirrored because they're like different angles relative to the like kind of plane of the chair. So I was kind of confused myself on that one. So I put diastereum more specific and anti Uh They're actually yeah. Because they were both. Didn't you mark them as the same molecule? No, I had B. Okay. Um, and it was both chiral centers were flipped. Yeah, because it was that, and then it's just both of those were flipped. Both of them were flipped. Equatorial. But the rest of them, they, they were both flipped, but it was the mirror image because I drew the orientation of this uh, cyclohexane was the same. Uh -huh. So yeah. even though they're both X, they're both X, blah, 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 equatorial, um, in the other one, <laughs> if it was the same molecule, it would look like this. Which is the mirror image of that one. Oh, right. So it's, the trick was that I drew this that uh, chair conformer not flipped. I drew it the same, yeah. but with them up. So they were um, in this one. They're still trans, but this is the mirror image. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's kind of what I got confused by. I'm like, okay, both chiral centers are flipped, but I was trying to picture it in my head, and I didn't think they would be mirror images. Yeah, so I don't know if that's where I it. Yeah, and I thought that the tricky part with that one was that it looks like they should be. It should be the same molecule because it looks like. Yeah, because so I just drew. I just drew out the molecule. Right. And like a flat projection, just to like make sure. No, uh, that's smart. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> that, that's the trick with that, right? Um, all right. Cool. Then uh, I think we're we're doing pretty good on that. We can move forward. Like I said, I have the key up here if anybody wants to see it, any specific answers if you didn't get enough feedback on the test. Yeah. Um, all right, then let's review a little bit of SN2. So a reminder, there's a lot of text on the slide. Um, the reaction rates for SN2 are inversely proportional to the stability of a carbocation in the same position as the leaving group. So if, it's, if the carbocation would be stable, that actually, so basically it's saying that that more sterics slow everything down, right? So we, we ranked these and we came up with that gray area. We know that of the chlorines, this was gonna be our fastest SN2 reaction. This was our slowest and this one's in the middle. When we with this leaving group, bromines being a better leaving group means it's going to be a faster reaction than the chlorine. But we are still in that gray area where chloromethane might be faster than than the bromopropane, um, just because bromine's a better leaving group. That one, and then we ended class uh, talking about that on Tuesday, um, how that's sort of in that that gray area where. I won't ask you a question like that on the test um, because you know it just takes some experience um, to to get an idea, and that's probably actually going to depend on the temperature. It's probably a case where if you change the temperature, we could get it to one of them to go faster than the other. All right, so the larger the groups are attached to the attached to the active carbon the slower the reaction. So in this just puts this, these are unitless numbers on the rates here, just compared to each other. So accounting for concentration and accounting for temperature, um, just looking at those relative rates. Um, and so this just allows us to say, okay, the uh, two bromo propane is a secondary alkyl halide. That's what's sort of our baseline. Um, as far and we compared everything else to that. A tertiary bromine was would be too slow to measure going through the SN2 reaction. But a primary, primary and primary bromoethane versus bromopropane, we get 16 and 14 times faster. And then methyl bromine, bromomethane, 
uh, is 1,200 times faster. So we're dealing with that, that A factor changing is really, really, you know, it's, there's an exponential relationship um, between some of these categories. So would we expect to see this, at, assuming this is at, at room temperature, would we expect to see this reaction happen? Probably not. Yeah, and too slow to measure it. The problem is if we actually do this reaction, if you take um, bromo, bromo methyl propane and put it in water, we actually do see this reaction happen pretty quickly. Right, and so that tells us that we must be having another mechanism in play. And so the other mechanism um, relies on some diff different factors because we found out from this, this just got moved down there. The rate law is it's just first order in your halo alkane and your concentration in the nucleophile doesn't affect the rate. So different rate law, it's gotta be a different mechanism. That's one of the, the easiest things, easiest conclusions you can draw. If there's a different rate law, it's gotta be going through a different mechanism. And so, and if it's first order, then our classifications is still going to be a nucleophilic substitution, but with it being first order, we call it SN1. Right, so if it's an SN1 reaction, it's first order, how can we try and draw this mechanism? And as to recap, the SN2 mechanism So we had SN2 mechanism looked like this. Right, we had that backside displacement where your nucleophile comes in, attacks the partial positive on the carbon, but then which then pushes the leaving group off to give us a net result of the that stereochemistry flip. Not that we have a different stereoisomer in this case, but, but we actually would see spatially those hydrogens which would shift to the other side as over the course of this reaction. And your leaving group is now left. That was this into you, true? Yes. And then this still has a another hydrogen line. So if that's SN2, it's second order because why? Two products, two molecules, yeah. two reactants. Sorry, you, did you say reactants? Yeah. Sorry, it sounded like reactions. Oh, but you're close. <laughs> yeah, two reactants. They have to bump into each other. Yeah. Because these two things have to run into each other, changing the concentration of either of them is going to change your rate. So this one being first order is only bit dependent on the concentration of the alkyl halide tells us the nucleophile is not part of the slow step. It's part of the balanced reaction, but the slow step only involves this molecule. So what is the slow step going to look like? Leaving group leaves. Bromine goes home, takes his toys with it. What is the result of that after the first step then? Positive charge, argon, and negative uh, products. I mean, is it going to be this no matter what? These products from SN2? 
Or is there going to be more? Than it'll that? be. It'll look similar, except we started with bromomethane instead of the the methyl propane okay. as our alkyl halide. But yeah, the net result is the same. So then, and if we're drawing our mechanism steps right, you should have no net change in the charge between steps, right? Because if we're accounting for all the electrons and protons that we started with, we should have the same overall charge. We started with two neutral molecules here, but so we have a positive and a negative, but, now, kind of but that sense. adds up, right? Still adds up to the same overall charge. And the, the water hasn't done anything yet. But what's going to happen if you've got a carbocation and an oxygen with lone pairs? The lone pairs can go through a nucleophilic attack. There's a partial negative on this oxygen that's going to be attracted to the positive charge on the carbon. And a neutral and a positive makes this molecule will still have a positive charge, except it's not going to be on carbon anymore because now we've got an oxygen with three bonds. We have like three SN1s, like steps, say the oxygen <laughs> had, uh, proton transfer, and then it was you know, forming alcohol into the next molecule. We usually see that happening after the fact. The water is stable enough on its own. It's not going to, you know, there is a, a K value, an equilibrium constant for water dissociating in making hydroxide and then the hydroxide being a nucleophile. Okay. But remember, K for that is like 10 to the minus 14. Oh, that's good. It's negligible. Once you make this molecule, it wants to kick off. now it'll kick off another proton okay. um, to make the alcohol. So same net results, but the order of the steps is backward, just based on probability. Right. Um, if we do this under basic conditions, then we wouldn't start with the water, we would just start with the hydroxide. Okay. And then you don't have to worry about showing that step at all, because you're starting with lots more hydroxide floating around. And so same, same two steps as SN2, except that SN2, they happen at the same times. I guess, so I guess it, it's the same two mechanism um, classification arrows, right? Still a nucleophilic attack and leaving group leaves. It's just, we have leaving group leaves and make an intermediate and then nucleophile attacks. As opposed to SN2, those both happen at the same time. So what if it makes this reaction like spontaneous, I guess? Um, so, it, it so go back to those pKa values. So, right. So it's so still it's, it's still the new, you know. Yeah. yeah. Your leaving group leaving is still going, and that's gonna be uphill in energy because we're making a carbon cation. Right. That's always gonna be less stable than having all the valence is filled. Right. But it does happen a small fraction of the time. And once it gets to this point, then it can either go back the way it came, if it happened to run into another bromide. It can, there's nothing saying it has to only go forward, but there's no point in really drawing a mechanism that ends where it started, right? Um, yes, it does happen when we can draw this as an equilibrium. But it's such a negligible. It's amount. going to be a negligible amount. Just don't really consider it. Right. And this is going to be equilibrium as well. But the thing is, if this is going to be uphill in energy, this is going to be uphill in energy. Making that intermediate is going to be uphill in energy from either side, but their relative heights 
are going to be based on how good of a leaving group you have. So the bromine is a really good leaving group. So that means you're going to have an overall decrease. Delta G is negative for the whole reaction, right? So K for this step, you know, maybe K is, uh, I don't know, 10 to the minus 7. But going from here back to that same intermediate might be 10 to the minus 34. Right, so it favors. Why would it favor a positively charged molecule over a neutral band? It does. This is your highest energy. Yes. Yeah. Your highest energy state is that intermediate. It doesn't. It's going to make that at a pretty small rate. But at the end, you still have a positive charge. Um, I'm sorry. I guess I, at the beginning, it, it, was this just a different example? Or? I didn't bother showing that last uh, proton transfer step. In this one, we mm. okay, got it. Yeah. so it's still downhill in energy for your nucleophile to attack compared to the carbocation. Right. It's not as downhill in energy as it could be. And this is that last step is the, the is the proton transfer, yeah. And so here we have our um, <laughs> methyl, 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 bromine. And here we have the carbocation. And then here we have, still with all three methyls, and the water molecule attached. This is more stable, even though you still have a positive charge, everything at least has a full valence here. Right. So that's still downhill in energy from the carbocation, where you have an incomplete valence. And then this can go through one last step to get to your final product, which turns that water into, a, into an OH. Yeah. So that is true. And that's that last step is going to be, yeah, it'll be on the recording. Um, that last step will be there if it's SN2 or SN1. Because if you think about the way we drew our SN2 mechanism at the beginning, we still had water acting as nucleophile and we still made this. We just made this in one step instead of two. So we just did this using the mechanism the previous slide, estimate what the PES looks like as the reaction progresses. Um, so what would the react what the reaction rates look like if we put the bromine on a primary versus a secondary versus a tertiary carbon? If I have those already drawn. No. The rate would be faster for tertiary, right? Compared to the other ones. Yeah. And then you can put it with it. Right. So <laughs> the tertiary for SN1, tertiary is going to be the fastest because that that carbocation is tertiary in the middle. And a tertiary carbocation is more stable than any of the other carbocations. So basically SN1 is going to be the exact opposite relative rates. For SN2, it was all about the sterics and how big the stuff was around that center carbon, right? The smaller the stuff was around that center carbon, the faster the SN2 process happened. Mm -hmm. For SN1, it's exactly opposite because a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary, it's more stable than a primary, it's more stable than a methyl. Right, so... For SN2, methyl is faster than primary, is faster than secondary, is faster than tertiary. For SN1, it's exactly opposite. Methyl is slower than primary, which is slower than secondary, which is slower than tertiary. 
So basically, we can always, if we have an alkyl halide, we can always get it to go through a substitution. It's just which of these mechanis mechanisms does it go through? When you you might think, well, so what's the big deal? We still get the same net product either way, right? Except for what, David? You shook your head. Why? Chirality, because chirality. And the SN1, you're forming a planar intermediate. Exactly. So because SN1 goes to that carbocation, there's two wrinkles. One, we lose that uh, chirality. We lose um, the stereochemistry. And the other thing is that if you make a carbocation intermediate, you open it up to being to a rearrangement. Remember that last category of step of mechanism steps rearrangement. was rearrangement. And you only see rearrangements predominantly with carbocations because they've got an empty space, right? If they've got an empty space that could be made more stable by moving hydrogen over, it does so. So you actually will wind up with different products in some cases, different constitutional isomers if it goes SN1 versus SN2 in some cases. Some cases you wind up with the same net result. If there's no stereochemistry involved and there's no possibility for rearrangement, you get the same product. And with the rearrangement, that would be like if initially a, like a secondary carbocation is formed, but there's a right next to it, there's a tertiary and so then a hydrogen would just bump over. Exactly. Okay. So let's, so we, we kind of hand wave really fast through rearrangements when we did mechanism steps before because they didn't really matter to us yet. They matter now. So for instance, um, let's say we have, this molecule, so same one from the test, right? If this molecule, if the leaving group leaves, then we're gonna wind up with a secondary carbocation. And then there's a hydrogen on here too, right? And then to keep the, um, the chart as balanced, we should also show our leaving group. So that we know that everything still adds up to a neutral charge. This molecule, this is a secondary carbocation, so middle of the road as far as our stability goes, but it's right next to a tertiary carbon. It's right next to a tertiary carbon. Remember that the, the reason that these secondary carbocations are more stable than primary is because all these other sigma bonds around it can donate a little bit of electron density to it to make it a little bit more stable, right? We call that hyperconjugation because it's not true resonance. It's not true conjugation, but just by having the sigma bonds around, that gives a little bit of electron density. Well, if that happens, you can all actually wind up with it dragging the entire hydrogen with it. Because if you move the whole hydrogen over, yeah, we, now we're, we filled one valence shell again, but and we left another one empty, but the one we left empty is a tertiary instead of seven. Exactly. Okay. So we wind up with this rearrangement where now our positive charge is here. And we've lost any stereochemistry. If we started with it just with the S isomer, as soon as the leaving group leaves, so we get that planar intermediate. Now we no longer are going to make, we're no longer going to prefer R versus S in our product even if it didn't rearrange. Turns out even once it rearranges, we further lose all stereochemistry because we're not even gonna make a stereoisomer for our product, right? We're gonna wind up with a carbon that has, that is not an asymmetric center. You paused like you were gonna ask a question. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So the one other piece of rearrangements, that, so this is a um, called a hydride rearrangement. Okay. Because we we moved over a hydrogen with a pair of electrons. That's so a hydrogen with a pair of electrons is a hydride. Um. So this is a. I guess the other term that you see used is a hydride migration, which makes it sound like there's you know, blocks of wild hydrides. 
um, moving from place to place. Wonderful imagery. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the other one that you can see is there are other, this is by far the most common because the hydride is the smallest thing that you can move. Remember that born oppenheimer approximation? These nuclei are all so much bigger than the electrons, but a hydrogen uh, nucleus is so much smaller than anything else. So if you're going to move a nucleus with a pair of electrons, it's going to be hydrogen most of the time if you can. However, if you do wind up in a situation where there are no hydrogens that can move over, if the bromine leaves again to make another carbocation, we have a positive charge here, a methyl, methyl, and on this side we have hydrogen and hydrogen. We could see a hydride shift like that, except that that doesn't really it doesn't make anything do worse. It. Yeah. You can't, you can't just like break the sigma bonds on the methyl groups to move that over to turn into a tertiary. So that is the other type of micro, uh, rearrangement we see hmm. is a methyl migration. Methyl and that would be and, and that's going to be slower. If we're choosing between moving a methyl and moving a hydrogen, it's always going to be the hydrogen. Yeah. But if we don't have that option, you can see a methyl rearrangement. Oh, okay. And so it would look just the same thing, except you move, get the CH3 moved over instead of just the hydrogen. But the reaction rate is going to be slower. That's going to be slower. Right. And you can see there are, there are more esoteric ones out there too. Um, like you can wind up sometimes with an entire ring structure shifting um, to make this from a six-sided ring into a five-sided ring. Things like that, if there's no other options. Um, so rearrangements is far bigger category of mechanisms than just hydrogens and methyls. We're going to start with just hydrogen and methyls because they're the most common by far. It's just like a whole range of different things. Right. Like rearrange. Anytime you wind up with the same molecule and the same, the, the key with a hydro with a rearrangement is that you have the same number of bonds and same types of bonds before and after. You just reposition them. Mm -hmm. So it's not a nucleophilic attack. That was one of the other ones um, somebody marked on, uh, on the test that there was that step um, where you had, let me clear this real quick. See, it was a carbon to an oxygen to a carbon to a carbon. Then there was another OH over here, right? And the mechanism step looked like this. Remember that on, on the back page? Um, then there were some other carbons still attached as well, but they didn't really matter. It was missing. Right. Um, somebody wrote down on that one, and again, I didn't mark it down. That, um, somebody marked down that this is a rearrangement. This is not a rearrangement because you don't get the same number of bonds before and after. You get the same total bonds, but you trade in a pi bond to make another sigma bond. And with rearrangement, it's just sigma. To another sigma. So it's another sigma. Right. You can't just create five bonds on Correct. Right. So this is a nucleophilic attack because you make a new sigma bond that you didn't have before at the expense of a pi bond, but still, even though it's within the same molecule, the fact that you have a net gain of sigma bonds tells you it's a nuclei and it's a nucleophilic attack. And yes, also that it's more stable. Okay. You had a cyclohexane with a methene opposite a carbocation. Would that be a nucleophilic attack or would that be a rearrangement? So say it again. Uh, carbocation opposite a uh, methene. So like this? Yeah, something like that. Maybe opposite. So it, or maybe that would do something too. Or like right, right over here. What are you? I was thinking opposite the other end of it. Yeah, over there. So 
that's far enough away, we're not really going to see anything. Generally, with these, these rearrangements have to happen relatively quickly because this intermediate is pretty unstable the way that it is. Um, so it's going to react with something. And if, it, if your rearrangement relies on two bonds moving, you're moving something from two carbons away, then that's going to be too slow generally. There's just not enough thermodynamic force that because that first step is going to be basically net zero as far as as gaining anything from it right i was thinking more as a uh, double cyclic structure that's made from that if it folds oh properly. like grab it across yeah if it folds properly i mean you can see stuff like that but again it's all going to be based on probability and rates right so if you happen to have it already in a structure where if this is Right. What am I doing here? So yeah, so if we happen to have a methyl over here that had three hydrogens and a carbocation over here, they're just kind of pointed in opposite directions. If you're in the, the axial, this is in the axial position, I guess maybe in that case, if it was here, because then you could have that one three diaxial interaction, you might see but it's just too far away. But it's just too far away. Yeah. yeah. I was just wondering with the double bond, how that would affect. So let's go back to that first one that you drew with the carbocation which are next to the methane. How would that rearrange? Or would that be a complete attack? Yeah, that guy. So you've got CH2 here. You are going to have what you'll what you'll see instead is resonance, okay? Because yeah. there's a resonance structure, right? It looks so like that. Like that. Position. So exactly, and that's going to be one of the next things we start adding is okay. Well, now out of these two, which is more stable, but this we have a positive charge on a primary carbon versus part. Uh, positive charge on a secondary carbon. So the secondary is going to be, it's, this is going to be more stable. You, your positive charge, you're going to have a larger, it's not, you don't want to think about it as a larger percentage of the time the positive charge is here. It's more like if you have one positive to spread over both of these is like 0.66 of a charge here and 0.33 of a charge there. So that's a more attractive target for a nucleophile. And that's why we spent time when we did resonance structures with ranking them as far as their significance. This is the more significant resonance structure. So this is the better target for a more nucleophile. Um, if this was two other carbons, then that's back. Then that's totally shifts everything, right? Even if your leaving group was on a secondary carbon, now the fact that we can put a positive charge on a tertiary carbon by resonating means that this is the better target, right? And so again, stability of these carbocations and how resonance works and rearrangements works is going to be the trickiest part of SN1. Um, but we, we've laid the groundwork, so just don't forget all of those skills that we learned before. No, those are good questions. Um, so if it's a lot of the same factors apply to SN1 as SN2, better leaving group is still going to make it go faster, right? Except instead of the, the nucleophile strength matters a little bit less in SN1 because the slow step is your leaving group leaves. So these first two, the more stable the leaving group, the faster the reaction. So the better leaving group, the further down it is on this chart, or further up, excuse me, it is on, on this chart, the better leaving group it is, therefore a faster reaction. The more stable your carbocation is, the faster the reaction goes. Because the nucleophile doesn't attack until after the slow step, it's not really going to affect the rate. So SN1, you can actually get away with using really weak nucleophiles because 
you know, anything with a pair with a lone pair is going to be attracted to that carbocation, right? To fill all the valences. So nucleophile strength doesn't really matter nearly as much here. For SN2, nucleophile strength mattered a lot, right? Because it had to be able to push the leading group out the door, right? These the nucleophile strength doesn't matter too much, but the solvent matters a lot more, right? The solvent is going to wind up playing a role because the solvent can stabilize that carbocation and also stabilize your nucleophile. Because your solvent, if you have a solvent that has that's a very polar solvent, it's going to have, be very attractive to the carbocation because positive charges and negative charges, right? But it's also going to be attracted to the nucleophile because if your nucleophile has a negative charge, then your solvent can wind up stabilizing the nucleophile. So changing your solvent winds up being sort of the final, um, the final variable that can that can twist this around and make it a little bit more complicated. Even is under the right solvents, chlorines are or uh, iodines are really strong nucleophiles. But if you put it in a, in water, it's a really weak nucleophile because it winds up being stabilized by the solvent. But we'll get there. And then the other thing to consider that we've all, that we just spent some time on is because the reaction goes through a carbocation intermediate, rearrangement can occur. So these reactions, SN1s in particular, are it can be really, really beneficial to draw out your intermediate. For SN2s, drawing your in, there is no intermediate, so drawing a mechanism doesn't really make that much. You don't need to worry about it that much. For SN1s, drawing the S, the intermediate so that you can see if there is a potential rearrangement can wind up being really helpful. All right, so let's try it. Out. these two reactions. Go for this first one. Leaving group leaves. Get a secondary carbocation intermediate. Any rearrangement we need to worry about? No. no. So we just wind up then with the nucleophile coming in and attaching. The final product. It looks like this. And for full credit answer on this, you'll actually have two products in this case. What are the two products? R and S. Yeah. And so you can draw both of them, or you can also say if they're going to be present in a 50-50 mixture, you can also just say you know, R plus S. If you wind up making a stereoisomer and it's going to be made in a roughly a 50-50 distribution that's called the racemic mixture. And that's or sometimes just called the statistical mixture. It's basically just it's not going to be exactly 50-50 sometimes because there can be other steric effects, especially if there's rings involved or other substituents, but it's going to be close to 50-50 mixture. 
Um, so in the way you would if you draw your product like this and just say R plus S, um, or just say receiving a mixture, that would be your full credit. You get you know, four out of five for getting here, and then one point to remember that there are two stereoisomers. Maybe. And then how about down here? Yeah, leaving group leaves, which then gives us this intermediate. Now we do have a, a rearrangement that can happen, right? We have to choose though between the hydrogen or the methyl shifting. Yeah, well, if the methyl shifts one, we we wind up with a secondary carbon cation back again, so we don't actually gain anything in that case. And two, the hydrogen's smaller. So we actually wind up with this molecule here. And in this case, we actually lose all stereochemistry another way, right? By shifting the hydrogen over, we're actually going to wind up with um, not only does the methyl go planar, so we could attack from either side, um, but when we add the nitrogen, there's it's going to be one stereoisomer that's formed. So final product here is going to be NH2 and a methyl group attached to the same carbon. I just rotated it so I had room to draw, but it's still that same carbon. All right, so as long as I'm telling you that it's SN1 or SN2, either of them is that tricky, right? The trickiest part is figuring out, do I have one versus the other? Do I have some mixture of the two? Generally speaking, it'll be one, one is going to be favored. The other one will happen, but in much smaller amounts, especially if we're talking about a tertiary carbon. Because if I skip all the way back to this slide, if your alkyl bromide is on a tertiary carbon, your SN2 is going to, is too slow to measure. So any reaction that does happen is going to be SN1. And on the flip side, a methyl carbocation is so unstable, it's going to be too slow to measure going SN1. Right? So really, it's only the secondary carbons which you really have to worry about it. If it's a secondary carbon, you have to look at the other factors to decide SN1 versus SN2. If it's primary, it's always, or if it's methyl, it's always going to go SN2. If it's tertiary, it's always going to go SN1. Secondary, you just have to look at the differentiation between the two different. It's going to depend on how good of a nucleophile you have and how good of a leaving group you have. Good leaving groups and weak nucleophiles favor SN1. Strong nucleophiles and weak leaving groups favor SN2 because you need that nucleophile to come in and force its way in to force the leaving group to leave. So, all right, let's. Let's take our break there and come back at 11, so 10 minutes, and we will do some more practice with this, add some more variables.
kind of the like the only other resource I've really been using outside of this class is uh, Chad's prep. Chad's, Chad's prep. He has like a, a whole thing on OAM. All the lectures are free. You can pay like 10 bucks a month to get access to like practice problems and stuff, but all the lectures are free and that's all you really need. If you're going to take Khan Academy? Yeah. yeah. That's usually what I go to. Nice. Yeah. I've done, I just like, honestly, Chad's format is it's really easy to follow. I like, I like how he teaches. And it's like him up in front of a whiteboard, which I like too. There's just something about like actually watching someone versus like pen on screen. Yeah, that seems sort of clunky though. It can be clunky, right? Just he, having... He's very organized. Uh, yeah. yeah, he doesn't care. He didn't get clunky at all. And they will like, it's cool because it's recorded so he can like, if he needs to erase the board or something, it just does like a little transition and like cuts to like, oh, he wants something the board set up for the next topic. Right. So. And he just does a really, really good, like how he explains things more. That was me the night before, and then yesterday I felt like exhausted all day and passed out and then last night. Yeah, I slept like over long, but that's only because I got like four hours of sleep because it was a wind storm. It was like crazy crap kind of falling all over the house. When was that? Not this last night, but the one before that. Around the Myers, towards the Myers, and Fender Trail. Just windy, huh? Mm -hmm. That was crazy. It was like super windy. Yeah, you gotta contribute to trees. Mm -hmm. It's not really your responsibility there. Are you just renting? Yeah, that's not your responsibility. But we've pointed out all the branches to the landlord. I do, I do. Like, I'll fix the house up too when there's stuff, and then they just like make rent cheaper. It's pretty great. Like, we have an awning that was outside the back sliding door, and the house was built like by idiots. Like, I don't know who designed it, but there was like one like completely dinky little support thing that was just screwed into the siding nice. that had already fallen off. And so I like, <laughs> I, I put some actual supports in there that finished it. And this was. This was funny, so I got like it's cute, just a little yeah, just break like break XL screws into the stud there, big bolt here to hold that up. I had to like brace that with a block because that was all loose. Like the whole thing's just built like crap. So, yeah, now I can hang off of it and do pull ups, and then and then I had a leftover four by four that I decided to give to my dog, and that's my roommate's girlfriend. <laughs> he, he got the whole four by four in his mouth. That's great. Good, good jazz. Good jazz. <laughs> yeah, everything seems junky nowadays. Once like the house, you know, my family's house in Pioneer, and my mom and my grandma live. I go down there, spend all my couch that time there. And uh, it's just built like this. Was, I was changing windows out, and the longest part was just doing the demo and like getting the old window out. And then it was like, 
someone just gave like a crackhead a staple gun because <laughs> there were some staples that didn't get driven all the way in, so then they got banged over and then stapled down again. And it's just <laughs> it's always fun to find out what the previous owners did. Yeah. Um, I had the uh second story of our house was definitely added without a whole lot of permits oh, no. and a lot of stuff done just by themselves. Yeah. And the electrical in particular oh. was just and one one switch box that's just two switches, but it had three different circuits running through it. They, they used it as a junction box for one circuit. Oh, that's and then both of the switches were on separate circuits as well. It's not like no, and so trying to figure out what was yeah, connected right. to what, trying to because all I was trying to do is replace the downstairs switch for a for a stairways. Oh yeah, I'm like I can't figure out why it's like it's not working. It's because it was on there was like three different things happening. Yeah, I've had a little bit of that that house too. Nothing that bad, but just random things. You're like, why did they wire it this way? Yeah, <laughs> and then that sucks because like if you you can't really change the wiring unless you're like tearing walls out. So right. So say okay, I have to get the multimeter out and then make an extension cord out of a spool of yeah. pile so I can test things <laughs> at two different ends of the hallway. Oh. Oh, that's a circuit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It does, you know, circuits was one of my worst sections in, in physics, mm -hmm. um, but I'm way better at circuits now than I was when I was in physics taking circuits. Right? Like when you have to get hands on and figure stuff out, you're like, okay, okay, I need to learn this now. <laughs> Don't think we calculate like amperage or resistance or anything like that, but. Exactly. <laughs> Just like integrating, right? I don't need to know how to integrate things by hand anymore because that's what computers are for. <laughs> I remember when Wolfram Alpha first like came out and it was a bell so exciting. It's like what this just does everything for you. Right. Well, between Wolfram Alpha and then the other the other trick is that you get a lot of non non-kind functions in kept from chemistry instruments. But everything puts out so many data points that you just do the rectangle method. Nice. And we did that for GC, right? Right, yeah. And we just GC plug everything into Excel, Excel no, and yeah. just do all the summing and right. the plots. Like, okay, DX is this, and we're just going to use whatever the signal is as Y yeah. and we'll sum it all up. Speaking of, I think there are still a few GC labs outstanding. I um, reminded. So you got yours. Okay, so it's the two people that aren't here. And I also turned in the chemistry and computers lab, but I got a zero on it. So I just went through and saw and did those this morning. Okay. Um, so double check that after class and I'll make and make sure that that happened. If you turned it in this today. No, it was it okay. Was, yeah. It was when it was due that I turned it in, but it said it was missing for the longest time, but it was right there to turn it in. So I Okay, so we'll double we'll, we'll, we'll double check. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, as far as the first half of the quarter, I'm still on the hook for the Bowman Q lab. Yes. Quarter, right? Okay. Yeah. Let's we'll do that, and you'll just have less of a safety net. Those early assignments are really there, so that so that if um, you miss an assignment later on, you got more of a cushion. You're just going to have less safety net. Okay. okay. And then is it okay if I bounce like five minutes early? By all means, I'll see what you got to do. Um. All right. The so some of the things that, like we mentioned at the end of, or right before we took our break, how do we decide which, which mechanism is going to be favored? One of the biggest things is how strong the nucleophile is. In general, a strong nucleophile tends to go, is more likely to go SN2 because it's better at forcing that leaving group out. Um, and so most of your strong nucleophiles are going to be things with a negative charge. All nucleophiles have to have at least a lone pair. If you've got a lone pair and a negative charge, typically that's a strong nucleophile. The trick here, so in, in, in general, in general um, one of the things you want to watch out for is that good leaving groups are not necessarily bad nucleophiles. You'll notice these three, those are our three most common leaving groups, right? They're way at the top of that chart, but they're also strong nucleophiles because they've got that negative charge. So, and the reason we can still get these things to favor the products at equilibrium 
now we're starting to get into solvent effects. When you've got um, especially the smaller alkyl halides tend to get basically surrounded by solvent molecules in a way that kind of makes them worse nucleophiles. These three in particular um, can be strong nucleophiles in the right solvent. Would be a non-polar solvent? In either a non-polar solvent or a polar aprotic solvent. Gotcha. And remember, that's that term. If it's a polar, but it doesn't have um, an acidic proton, it's a polar aprotic solvent. And there's a couple that are really common, acetone. Um, I'm gonna, I know all of the abbreviations, but I'm gonna mess up. So this is dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, there's, and TMF, tetram, no, that's not polar. Um, in a couple of slides, we have a list of them. Gotcha, gotcha. But this is the most common one, and acetone's another common example. It's something that's polar, but without a proton, which means it's, it's partial positive is not very strong. There can be no hydrogen bonding. Would be a weak nucleophile. Okay. In that, so that would be good for being a good nucleophile in, a, in those solvents. Like so, these three, these alkyl hal or these halides can be good nucleophiles as long as you're in one of these aprotic solvents. So the trend just kind of like, in a sense, reverses depending on the solvent. Aprotic versus protic. Right. Okay. You know, hydroxide is going to be a good salt, good nucleophile no matter what. Um, you know, the really bad leaving groups are going to be good nucleophiles no matter what. It's these three in particular that can be, they're good leaving groups, but they can also be a good nucleophile if you're in the right solvent. So in water, it's the opposite. In polar, they wouldn't be, they'd be weak. Maybe weak nucleophiles in water, and they're strong nucleophiles um, in aprotic solvents. And the other way to think about the aprotic solvents is remember your definition of intermolecular forces. Um, anytime you had hydrogen attached to nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, um, or chlorine, um, you had a you had the ability to make hydrogen bonds with other molecules around, right? Because that hydrogen only has electrons in the 1s orbital, right? And if it only has electrons in the 1s orbital and those electrons are part of a polar bond, that hydrogen is basically exposed. The nucleus is really exposed, which gives it lots of, one, makes it acidic, and two, gives it a really strong partial positive, which makes it a good electrophile, which, weakens your nucleophile because basically even if it doesn't form if we've got a whole bunch of say methanol molecules around a chloride that would just increase the stereotypes more polarity exactly you basically surround your nucleophile with all of these interactions that are fairly strong and they basically create a shell around your nucleophile and that means that that shell makes it so that it doesn't behave like a strong nucleophile. The aprotic solvents don't have that. Even if they're a polar molecule like acetone. And fluoride in particular is the one that's most subject to the solvent effects. Fluoride can be a very strong nucleophile in an aprotic solvent and almost a non-existent nucleophile in a protic solvent, which is why it just gets left off of these lists a lot of the time because it's really hard to classify it mm -hmm. um, one way or the other. All right, so if we put fluoride or any of these strong nucleophiles in water, and especially the smaller the nucleophile, the more the solvent effect takes, takes precedence. Because the smaller your nucleophile, the more that solvent shell can basically keep it sequestered. Iodide is less affected by solvent. 
than bromide, which is less effective than chloride, which is less effective than fluoride. So fluoride has the biggest swing when you're in a protic solvent. Would this just be like sent this uh, reaction here? Would it be just accentuated hydrogen bonding pretty much? It's, yeah, and, and there's reason to equilibrium. It's a weak acid, weak base right. reaction, right? Water is a weak base, is a weak acid. Fluoride is a weak base. When you put them together, you get this happening back and forth. And any protic solvent with any weak base is going to do that back and forth. And that means that there's a significant, not only do you have that solvent shell we were just talking about, but there's a significant portion of the time where your fluoride is not actually fluoride, it's hydrofluoric acid, and it's a covalent compound, and it's not going to act as a nucleophile very well because now it doesn't have a negative charge. And so, in general, these substitution reactions have to happen in a polar solvent of some sort because our nucleophiles are mostly either polar or charged and our leaving groups, once they leave, are either polar or charged. And so we have to have a polar solvent that can stabilize that and keep things dissolved. But it doesn't have to be protic. That's the big swing. Uh, because a a positive charge can be stabilized by a polar aprotic solvent, but a negative charge really isn't very much in, once it's aprotic. Right? And so the, the, we need the polar solvent in order for it, especially for it to go SN1. Um, even if it's going to go SN2, we still need some amount of polarity of the solvent. So we don't really see these in true nonpolar solvents. And we can look at this in terms of the potential energy surface. Because, especially for SN1, we actually wind up with a larger leap to that intermediate and a larger barrier if we're in a nonpolar solvent, because the transition state and the intermediate both having a charge. The transition state doesn't necessarily truly have a charge, but you've got that sort of polar character to it because you're breaking bonds and forming bonds. The more polar your solvent is, the faster these substitution reactions happen. Because we make everything more stable. with the added caveat that the protic versus aprotic winds up playing a role as well. So we want to stabilize, we want the reaction to happen. We want to stabilize the reactants and transition states with a polar solvent. We don't want to stabilize the reactants too much because if we stabilize the reactants too much, then that, that's going to make it so that nothing will happen. And, and so the more we can stabilize, the the more we can stabilize the transition state without stabilizing the reactants, the faster things will go. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's where the protic solvents come in, or the aprotic solvents come in, because protic solvents stabilize those reactants too much. Right, so here's the list of the protic solvents versus aprotic solvents. So really common protic solvents: water, methanol, ethanol, most common ones. We actually will see acetic acid as a solvent sometimes. It's named as an acid even, so we know it's protic. Uh, ammonia is another protic one. It's a weaker acid than water or, or these alcohols, but it still is, is a protic solvent because you can make those hydrogen bonds. Our common aprotic solvents, acetone, dimethyl sulfoxide, DMF, not, not TMS, dimethyl formamide, um, HMPA, we don't see that one all that much. Acetonitrile gets used industrially, but won't use it much in, in uh, class or in lab. Uh, DMSO and DMF are the most common ones that we see. We don't really use acetone as a solvent all that often, um, basically because there are too many other reactions that can happen with acetone. Um, it's, and because it gets used for cleaning so much, we don't want to 
just from a practical standpoint, it's a lot easier to just keep acetone just for cleaning and, and then use DMF or, TM or uh, DMSO as our proto a protic solvents. So, and what winds up happening, here's what I was describing before, is a positive charge can be stabilized by those lone pairs here. But this hysterics wind up preventing negative charges and nucleophiles from being stabilized as much. So it's still a polar solvent. You can still dissolve ionic compounds in it, but you don't stabilize the negative charges very well. So this would make your chlorine a better nucleophile. This would make chlorine a better nucleophile than it would be. And, and we the, again, the biggest swing is with fluoride because fluoride's already so small and it's already a better, a stronger base than chloride is. So it can basically just totally render itself useless as a nucleophile if you're in a protic solvent. But as soon as you put it in a protic solvent, it's a very strong nucleophile. Right, and so we can look at the effect of the solvent on the rates of SN2 reactions. So we have, here's our relative rate in a protic solvent, relative rates in an aprotic solvent. And we're using bromide as the nucleophile as our, as our benchmark. So in a protic solvent, we see that chloride and fluoride are much worse as a nucleophile. The rate is much, much slower. And iodine is a pretty strong uh, nucleophile. However, we do this in DMF, one, all of them are much faster, right? Just going from bromide in methanol to bromide in DMF, we saw a 21,000 time increase in the rate because we're not stabilizing our nucleophile too much. Eight fluoride is 82 million times faster as a nucleophile. It was slower than bromide before, and now it's twice as fast. It was you know, roughly a thousand times slower than the bromide. And just by switching the solvent, it became twice as fast as the bromide. Um, so what that tells us is, especially with these nucleophiles, we need to pay attention to what solvent we're in, and that's going to help determine which um, pathway we go through as well. Is it SN1 or SN2? Because a weaker nucleophile is more likely to go through SN1. Right? So if we're in a protic solvent, we're much more likely to see SN1. If we're in an aprotic solvent, it's much more likely to, to go SN2 if we still have a strong nucleophile. In, here's our general rule. Strongest base will also be the strongest nucleophile unless both of these are true. The reaction is in a protic solvent and the bases differ in size. Because that's where we got that, that reverse in that protic solvent. If you're in a protic solvent, the smaller your base, the smaller your nucleophile, the more it's hindered by the solvent itself, the more it's stabilized by the solvent itself. Iodine being so big, it's less affected by the solvent just because you can't really totally surround it with solvent molecules the same way that you can with fluoride, just because of the physical size. So in a polar aprotic solvent, we wind up with increasing nucleophilicity, and then it's opposite if we're in a protic polar solvent. And this is just for these three, or these four. All right, so the bigger they get, the less they're affected by the solvent. Again, this is really, this is really getting down to the splitting hairs part. So I know we're spending more time on this because it's more complicated. <clears throat> the most basic point is stronger nu the nucleophile is, the worse it is as a leaving group. And that allows us to predict what re reaction we're going to have happen or what the equilibri relative equilibrium constants, constants are. 
So basically, our products are reactants it's favored. This part is going to be dependent entirely on nucleophile strength and how good of a leaving group something is. So with this tiny little table down here, that's going to be how we can determine. We can fill this out for an SN2 reaction regardless. We just don't know if it'll actually happen. So what is our product going to be for each of these? It's SN2. For this first one, we'd see this if it's SN2, right? Plus bromide. Which side is favored? The left side would be favored reactants, right? Why? It's in DMF, which is it's going to be hard. <laughs> so let me let me so this is another point that I was just about to make, but I was going to let you answer this first. Our standard case is polar aprotic. If you're polar aprotic, then don't worry as much okay. about solvent. It just means you can just look at pKa's. You don't need to worry about anything else throwing stuff off. So polar aprotic means all you do is whatever is the better or the weaker base is the better leaving group. So if we're comparing these two. Which one's the better leaving group? Or, no, sorry, the bromine. The bromine is a better leaving group, which makes NH3, NH3 the better NH3 nucleophile. The better nucleophile yeah. Which means this side is favored at equilibrium. Right. So I mean, that's I will say that again. Don't worry about solvent effects unless it's protic. If it was protic, it would favor the reactant. If it was protic, it would still favor this because if it's protic, that makes the bromide, the bromide a worse gotcha. nucleophile. So in protic solvent, it actually might further favor the product side. Okay. All right, how about for this next one? And especially when we're considering the halogens, that's when the solvent effects become the most important. But we're still in the aprotic solvent, so don't worry about that. So which side's favored at equilibrium? Still the products. Because bromine's a better leaving group than, it, than it fluoride. And fluoride's a better nucleophile. And which, by the same token, fluoride's a better nucleophile. This is one that flips entirely if you do it in water. Or any protic solvent, because fluoride becomes a much weaker nucleophile as soon as you surround it with a protic solvent. Same reaction here as above, right? Yeah. If we're doing this in water, this is this is one where we probably actually want to look at numbers because bromine is so much larger than the ammonia. But the difference in their pKa values is so large, 10 to the 18, that I don't think it would fully switch. I think you would still favor the products, but maybe not as strongly. 
because you're going to slow down the nitrogen as a nucleophile by surrounding it with water molecules. And you're also going to make it a better leaving group because it's going to have more stabilization on the reactant side. But again, it's one of those where we'd want to look at it and actually get some numbers because there's such a big gap here. In general, like I said, in general, neg neglect solvent effects. And usually um, we're going to try and do, if we're using a protic solvent for substitution reactions, we're usually going to have our try to have our nucleophile be the solvent molecule or the conjugate base of the solvent molecule. So if we have hydroxide acting as a nucleophile, we can do it in water because the conjugate base of water is hydroxide. So it doesn't matter if we have any weak base reactions happening, we're still gonna have a constant amount of hydroxide. So in same with like ethanol or methanol, if we're using those as the nucleophile, we'll probably use them as the solvent as well because then there's that, that solvent shell becomes irrelevant, right? And our more common case is that we're going to have these as our solvents, and then we can just look at it leaving groups versus um, base strength. So without it being specified, could we assume polar aprotic in SN2? If it's not specified, then you're going to want to double check that your reactant is not also the solvent. Right. If we if I just said this plus water, then I don't need to specify what the solvent is because water is a solvent. And a really common one, right? Um, if it's not specified, then then double check that's the case. Let's yeah. see whether that's the case. Would it be SN2 then for a protic? If it's a Polar aprotic solvent that's going to favor SN2 more because your nucleophiles are stronger in an aprotic solvent. A weak nucleophile is going to favor SN1. But again, we're still only talking about if it's a secondary carbon, right? Because primary carbon and tertiary carbon are already decided. If you try to do a Let's say we did a um, we've got a tertiary carbon has a leading group on it. If we try to do this with a weak nucleophile in a protic solvent. I think, yeah, we can still draw it. But SN2 doesn't happen. SN1 will happen, right? In which case the nucleophile strength doesn't matter as much. If we try to force it to be an SN2, so let's say we did almost the same molecule, but we put the bromine on the methyl group. So it's a primary leaving group. That would favor SN2 normally, right? But if we try to do that with fluoride in water, that's going to be such a weak nucleophile. We basically, we just see no reaction because it can't go SN1 because it's a primary carbon. And our nucleophile is so weak that it can't go SN2. So in that case, we would just say no reaction. Even though that's like a primary carbon, it can really easily rearrange into a tertiary just because those are two different steps. Just, just because, because yeah, you primary. can't even yeah. get to a point where you can do a rearrangement right. because it's primary. You still got to be able to make that, have that leaving group leave. And that's a duplicate slide. These are all duplicate slides. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and actually, I do think that that's a reasonable place to stop. That's enough for us to cover that what's on the quiz this weekend. Don't forget to take the quiz this weekend. It's just going to be 
This goes SN2, what's your product? This goes SN1, what's your product? I'll tell you the mechanism still at this point. That's quiz five, right? Not quiz six. Quiz, it'll be quiz six because quiz four and five, half of you took quiz four and half of you took quiz five. So I'm just gonna grade them both okay. and call them the same quiz. Yeah. So quiz six has the due date of Sunday. So watch the due dates and just, um, and if you didn't take, if you took quiz five, but not four, then don't worry about it. If you took four but not five, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, no, we did the opposite. I did four. Yeah. You did five, right? No, I did four. And, uh, so I might have done five. Like, I don't know. Yeah, don't. It doesn't matter. It does. Yeah. I, that was just a mistake on my part. I accidentally had both of them live at the same time. Right. Yeah. I just wasn't sure if we had a quiz for last week. Even like, sure. No. Well, it's midterm. Yeah. Midterm with the quiz. So in terms of like uh, favorability of mechanisms and all that kind of stuff, is that going to be on the quiz or or is it going to be like this? I, is... I will double check, but no, I that I okay. believe that the quiz was here's a and here's an SN two, here's SN one, SN two, which what? I favored at equilibrium, okay. um, and we'll get more into how these competing mechanism cases next week. I mean, Sam, for this, are you going to give us something that won't do that? I believe there were one or two no reactions on uh, Yeah, okay. but they were the exception. Out of 10 reactions, I think maybe one of them was a no reaction. Okay. More to come on that. Yeah, absolutely.